Anyways, here we are. New Vati video just dropped. I can't wait to check it out. I can always... Oh, I will always love more Millennia content, so... The lore of Elden Ring is rotten. That's so true. Uh, as far as I've seen, this isn't like a prepare to cry uh, type video, but... Oh, it's long, so we'll... We'll see how this goes. It's gonna be... Yeah, I'm with the show again. No more distractions. <laughs> we went on a 50-minute tangent. Oh, your cyborg future self can finish your work for you hundreds of years after the original. Well, I mean, why don't, why don't we just find a way to preserve my brain so that I can actually do it? You know? Anyways. Let's, uh, let's see. Just let me know if the audio is weird or whatever. The Scarlet Rot is one of the deadliest things in the Lands Between, for it has no real cure, and famously even the demigods could not stave off its effects. I guess no one told them about preserving boluses, huh? Anyway, what's really interesting about the Scarlet Rot is that it's actually a very old legend, one that predates Melania and all of the horrors found in Kaled. And so, it. to understand where it all began, we have to go below. Well, if if I have a jar, a head in a jar, you just attach it to a robot and I control the arms. That's all. To the Lake of Rot, where we can find a few item descriptions that speak of this time. For example, here in the southeastern corner, we can loot a crown of mushrooms yeah. that forms this towering headpiece. And it reads, Long ago, great lords served the Scarlet Rot. Perhaps such fungal bodies served as their crowns. And the rest of this set is made up of the mushroom set, which are considered holy vestments for those enraptured by the Scarlet Rot Hell yeah. that root them to the earth. So already we have this hierarchy of mushroom lords that served the Scarlet Rot back then, as well as worshippers who venerated it. And you might think it's strange that these beings might worship or serve a sickness, but the Scarlet Rot is so much more than that. Yeah. Because the Scarlet I was gonna say, it's like a whole thriving ecosystem. Like, the whole, all of Kaled has its own thing going on. It's like saying a forest is a sickness, you know? Like, look, this, this shit's thriving, it's alive, just because something else doesn't- I mean, a fish isn't gonna survive in the desert. It's just how it is. The Scarlet Rot's just uh, a slightly more- well, toxic to stuff that isn't from the Scarlet Rot. Couldn't the same be said for athlete's foot? Yeah, that's a whole that's a that's a whole other ecosystem. That's true. Yeah, yeah, it's a fungus, right? Scarlet Rot is no mere disease. No, for proof of that, one only need look at the Crystallian. Crystallian are inorganic beings, and yet they can be afflicted by the rot just like any other. Silicone-based life forms. We've had this discussion before. just you know there we go but there's even some crystallians that are infused with rot and can spread it to others as well because it's not really just a disease instead the map for the lake of rot calls it the divine essence of an outer god something that was sealed away long ago in this underground world and if you've been following Elden Ring lore for any length of time, you should be no stranger to the concept of an outer god. They are these indeterminable, abstract beings that impress an order or a will upon the world through their avatars, Hell their yeah. servants, and their vessels. I love Moe. And in the case of the Scarlet Rot, its order is one of decay, where beings are put into a progressing state of death with the intent to achieve this glorious rebirth that will follow that process. The Poison Armament description tells us this, saying that those who dwell within poison know rot all too well. Wait, so I hope that we learn about Millennia's second bloom in this, because I only know... I only remember information about her first bloom with Radon, and then the third bloom with us. I don't really know much about her second bloom. Or, I don't... I didn't retain anything if we learned it. The death that begets life that comes to all equally. That is to say, it is the cycle of rebirth put into practice. 
Yeah. A great example of this is Michaelis Halig tree, which might be completely dead were it not for the fungal growths that have sprouted upon the tree. And of course we also see this in Caelid, where flowers of the rot are on the very precipice of budding, despite all the decay. I want to see them burst open. I think it'd be so cool. Honestly, I would love to see like further evolution of the Scarlet Rot. I think that'd be really cool. Of course, it's debatable whether this type of life is even desirable at all, but you can't argue that it is life and the agents of the Rot God <coughs> certainly find it desirable, so they do their utmost to spark this sacred cycle of rebirth in others, infecting them mm. with poison and rot <coughs> and putting this cycle of rebirth into practice. On that note, there is one extremely curious item that you can find down in the Grand Cloister, and it's called the Scorpion Stinger. This is a dagger that's glistening with scarlet rot, and it's called a ceremonial tool which I think means that any ceremony that used this dagger would have been a ceremony to stab and infect another being with the Scarlet Rot. Cool. It would have been a ceremony of spreading their treasured affliction to others. But what's really interesting about this dagger is that it's fashioned from a great scorpion's tail, and it's also specifically said to have been crafted from the relic of a sealed outer god. And when you consider that phrasing, it makes you realize that it's saying that this dagger was fashioned from a relic of the Rot God, who was also a great scorpion. That's what it sounds like it's saying. Anyway, I mean, many historical relics in our history are often the physical remains of deceased saints or holy persons, so the God of Rot might really be, or at least might have manifested as, a great scorpion. That's cool. So, I guess this scorpion stinger is kind of like the Eye of the Fell God, or the Three Fingers of Frenzy, or mm -hmm. the whole winged theme that death has going on. It's a small remaining hint at the visual identity of these ephemeral outer gods that is intended to stimulate the imagination, even if we never truly find out what these outer gods look like. So that's probably what those flowers look like when they do bloom. The ones that are all closed, this this very well might be what they look like. I would love to see a whole bunch of those around Caleb. That'd be so cool. Look like. And whatever rot truly is, it and its scarlet rot essence was eventually conquered, or sealed, at least. This was done by a legendary figure known as the Blind Swordsman. Oh. As the story goes, the Blind Swordsman was favored by a fairy called the Dancer in Blue. Yeah. The fairy bestowed upon them a flowing curved sword, which was patterned after flowing water, and with this sword, the blind swordsman sealed away an ancient god, a god that was Rot itself. There's quite a bit to unpack in these descriptions. It's a big bottle opener. First, who or what was the fairy called the Blue Dancer? Well, I think that the warrior's blue cloth set gives us a clue. It reveals that the blue color of its fabric symbolizes brisk waters, and the cloth doll that represents the blue dancer is styled to look just like water. I think it would be really interesting if, like, you approached Millennia wearing the the blue like water warrior set, if she would like say something different. At least in like her first stage, because in in her second stage when she becomes the goddess of rot. I mean, I feel like she's pretty overtaken uh, and not really millennia anymore. I think that it, it would be it would be so cool to see more interactions between bosses and the armor sets you wear or the weapons that you have or things that you've done, you know, like like if you kill someone's buddy, they they like aggro more, or they attack faster, you know? I think it'd be really cool. Just, even just having different lines that they can drop. I'd really love to see more um, personalizing of interactions with characters in games. She probably senses. I mean, she doesn't really have any eyes left, right? They kind of got rotted out. But, you know... My point still stands. I'm sure she would be able to sense the uh, the warrior energy 
like her former mentor interact differently based on your stats too that would be cool that'd be cool the description goes on to say that just as still waters turn foul stagnation leads to decay so warriors must remain ever drifting it's essentially saying that flowing water is the very antithesis to rot which thrives in stagnant water and i think and this is just speculation, but I think that the Blue Fairy might essentially be a sort of river spirit. If you've ever seen Hayao Miyazaki's Spirited yeah. Away, then you might so know good. what type of being I'm talking about. In that movie, just quickly, a stinking sludge monster yep. comes to the bathhouse, where it is eventually revealed that it's actually a river spirit whose river was bogged down and corrupted by Polluted. pollution. Yeah. But once his waters are unblocked, the river spirit is restored. And Elden Ring, by comparison, does also have two legendary rivers called the Shifra and the Ainzel, which just so happened to flow underground next to and around the scarlet rot that was eventually sealed all that time ago. So I don't think that it's a stretch to think that the Blue Fairy might have occupied or might have been a supernatural extension of those underground rivers. I think it's a fun theory. And I think it helps to explain the Blue Fairy's relationship with water and why it might be a natural enemy of the yeah. Rot God. So the Blue Fairy gave the blind swordsman a flowing sword and he fought with the power of flowing water to seal away the Rot God. But what's unclear here is how exactly the Scarlet Rot God was sealed away by the blind swordsman. Did he, you know, sword in hand, battle a great scorpion boss in one-on-one -on -one combat and just seal its essence away? Or was their battle more of an abstract one, where the Eternal City dams were built and rivers were rerouted to encircle the rock and contain it underground, or something like that? These details are left to your imagination, but one way or another, the Scarlet Rot God was sealed away but it was not defeated, and eventually it would return. And this time, it would do so in an Empyrean vessel, corrupting Melania, a demigod, at the very moment of her birth. That would be amazing, Bridges. Melania Scarlet. Man, I feel so bad for Melania. Like her brother, Mikola, Melania was born an Empyrean. Empyrean meaning she was essentially a valid candidate to replace Queen Marika as a god, and as such it seems she was a ripe candidate for an outer god's meddling. And it's unclear how the rot god afflicted Melania as soon as she was born, but it did, and that's a shame because Melania's great rune does state that it should have been the most sacred great rune of them all were it not for what I assume was the Rot God's meddling. And speaking of great runes, in the sister video to this one, we talk about how mm -hmm. Mikola was essentially the flip side to Melania in many ways, especially in cut content where the twins were born of an inseparable fate and said to hold the runes of both abundance and decay between them. And to reflect this duality, it seems, Mikola is in this constant state of overflowing abundance, while Melania was in this constant state of overflowing death, essentially. We sort of see this tragedy unfolding in a few statues of Melania, since you can see back then she did actually have all her limbs once upon a time, until the rot continued to take hold, moving her inexorably towards her inevitable death and rebirth as well. And that must have felt inevitable, for it seems like in these early days there were few known ways to ward off the rot. Fire was probably the obvious one, and then there was also the act of consecration which was used, uh, which is essentially the act of declaring something as sacred, which was done to the weaponry of Melania and her knights, and apparently it helped their armaments, at least, to resist the rot but their flesh was still susceptible. Melania's knights were therefore called the Clean Rot Knights, and they vowed to fight alongside Melania despite the inevitable, if gradual, putrefaction of their flesh. And it was this fact that made these warriors so fierce, for they had basically already accepted their terrible fate, and so logically, they had nothing else oh. to lose in battle. These 
So a lot of those soldiers that were already dead out there were the clean rot knights of millennia from from ages past. You know, learning about like Radon and Millennia made that whole battlefield hit a little different. Just just saying. Knights were bestowed the winged sword insignia, given only to those who fought alongside Melania the Severed. Interestingly, this is the only item that gives Melania the title the Severed. Yeah. And I assume that it's referencing a time where Melania was known for her prowess despite her fragmented body, as it's called in the Japanese. And I guess it's possible that she wasn't yet known as the Blade of Mikula at the time, though that's just my own speculation. At any rate, Melania Blade of Mikula is her most common title, and it's easy to see why she would dedicate herself to her brother so fully. For her brother was so dismayed by her condition that he dedicated himself right? to finding a treatment for the rot, and this search for a cure dramatically affected Mikula's worldview. For instance, he was formerly a faithful fundamentalist of the Golden Order, with all the magic to boot, but he would abandon those practices as they could do nothing to treat his sister's accursed rot. Instead, he pursued a path of unalloyed gold, and he crafted for Melania a needle that could be inserted into her flesh, granting relief from the rot and preventing the progression of the rotting sickness. So, where was it implanted? Because... Okay, I've spent a lot of time fishing, all right, in my life. This is designed to go in and not come out. So it's not like she can just poke it in random places whenever she feels... Like, where... Do we have any information as to where it was implanted? Because this is not something that's coming out without causing extreme amounts of distress. Like, did they implant it into her heart? Did they implant it, like, in her, in her, in, like, where her arm came off? Does she have multiple? Does she just have the one? That, I'm not sure. I don't know. A true good catch, yeah. Rips out the rot when removed. I, God, I don't know, man. This would definitely rip some stuff on the way out, though. If you're interested in why Unalloyed Gold was able to do this and work that way, then I'd recommend you check out this video afterwards, which talks at length about Mikula. But we learn about the needle's specific effects in-game when we give it to a character called Millicent, oh, uh, who is also sec, suffering sorry. from the Scarlet Rot. What? Millicent is this great parallel to Melania that teaches us so much about what Melania might have felt or experienced. So I'll tell you more later, Bridges. has lost a limb, and she is also losing her memories, and when we find her, she is unable to even move. But as soon as we give her the needle, she's able to function and fight once more. Therefore, it's fair to assume that similar benefits were conferred upon Melania when her brother gave her the needle. It's also worth noting that the multiple needles that we find in-game, they aren't finished. Even the final version of this needle can only be used in the storm beyond time at Farum Azula, <laughs> where it allows you to cheat fate, essentially. And that makes sense here, because you're outside of time in this place, so maybe you can prevent um. these afflictions. Oh my god. Yeah, that was not good. It's like 
Ew. Ew, that was fucking gross. What the fuck? Yeah, no. It was like a a beer with v vanilla, but it just tasted like vanilla extract and beer. It was so gross. Oh, God. All right. Back to the video. ...from the Outer Gods before they even happen. So perhaps if Mikola had been able to imbue his needle with some time warping capabilities, he could have eventually undone the effects of the Rot God entirely, but again, the needle was unfortunately never finished. The needle isn't all that Mikola created with unalloyed gold. He also crafted for his sister a prosthetic arm, leg, helmet, and armor of unalloyed gold, which again, like Millicent, surely allowed her to overcome her one-armed shortcoming and reach for newer heights as a fighter. So Melania's prospects were already looking up, but things didn't Ouch. end there, for Melania would go on to meet a man who would become her mentor, and he would give her this final invaluable tool that could be employed against the Scarlet Rot. Flowing we water. see their meeting play out on this image of the prosthesis wearer heirloom, which depicts Ooh. a scene from a heroic tale. You can even see Melania's prosthetic arm and leg in this image if you look closely, which is why I assume that this meeting took place after Mikola's intervention with all of the unalloyed gold prosthetics. So her mentor was, as you might have guessed, the blind swordsman. The man who first sealed away the rot all those years ago, the very same. And after encountering her mentor and his flowing blade, she gained wings of unparalleled strength. This meeting says a lot about the blind swordsman. He must have known that Melania was basically inhabited by his ancient enemy, and yet he doesn't attempt to kill her here. Instead, he takes her under his wing and teaches her the techniques that he himself once used to curtail the rot in the first place. It's a pretty wise thing to do, and perhaps we shouldn't expect any less from someone who was able to defeat an outer god in the first place. So this is why the skill on Melania's blade is called the Waterfowl Dance. Yeah. This is why Melania recovers health by attacking during her boss fight, by moving relentlessly like flowing water, the damage of the rot was offset, and Melania was able to achieve unparalleled strength and to maintain her pride. But it was that same pride that she would abandon in her fight with Radan. Yeah, that's sad. All right, Avanti's videos are top tier. They're so good. I can't wait for the Radan next one. Radan was born to cry. of Queen Ranala, who was the Queen of Caria, and King Consort Radigan who was previously a great champion of the Erd Tree. Thus was the Order of the Moon and the Erd Tree conjoined. And while Radan was a true Karian, and certainly proficient in the art of sorcery, we can see in his character an inclination towards another path, an aspiration to be like Godfrey, for example, who was yeah. the first Elden Lord, and also his father Radigan, who would become the second Elden Lord. Caria was, after all, a largely matriarchal society, True. meaning that power was passed down to the princesses in the family. So perhaps it's no surprise that Radan was not as motivated by his Carian heritage compared to his sister Rani, that for makes instance. Sense. So Radan's set was decorated with a golden lion that symbolized Godfrey and his beast regent, and it yeah, states Siraj. that from his youngest years, Radan was naturally captivated by the lord of the battlefield. Then his golden helmet was designed with his flaming red hair in mind, which Radan inherited from his father, drawing attention to the fact that he was fond of the heroic implications of being Radigan's son. Radan and his knights were fittingly known as the Red Mane, which conflates Radan's red hair with the mane of Godfrey's lion, and Radan was even quoted as saying, I was born a champion's cub, now I am the lord of the battlefield's lion which borders on being a statement of complete loyalty to Godfrey and the Golden Order, but we'll get to that debate a little bit later. So naturally, this was a guy who reveled in the art of warfare, 
and even in his youth as a carrion royal, it seems Radan was already a renowned general. We can infer this because of a man named Jeren. The eccentric's armor specifically says that after spending time as a guest of the Karian royals, he became a guest commander for General Radan. Therefore, Radan must have still been in close contact with his Karian family, as Jeren met Radan through these Karian royals. And Petting when they did meet, Jeren and Radan seemed to immediately share a certain bond. For despite Jeren preferring to have a nomadic existence, he decided to become a guest commander hmm. for General Radan, and then. Despite the temporary implication of such a title, Jeren, this restless tumbleweed, as he was a called, tumbleweed. would become bound by honorable oath, and he and Radan swore a vow of honorable death to one another. You can stay and watch it with us. They would want. die honorably in battle, even if it was death by the other's hand. So it's not stated which battles that Radan was fighting at the time, nor which war he required a new guest commander for. But then the world is very different at the time, and there's so much of the lands between history that we don't know about. So I guess it's possible that the battles were okay, being fought for distant bye. lands like Limgrave and Caled. The Limgrave East map does say, after all, that this path here was trod by many a soldier in the past. Bye, Dad. Have a good one. See Maybe ya. Radan's forces took this path as well. And this was before Caled was I even afflicted with the Scarlet Ooh. Rot. So. Things might have looked really different here. Well, yeah, I wonder what Caled was like before the fight between uh, Radon and Millennia. Because the whole reason why this area is afflicted by Scarlet Rot is because of Millennia's bloom, right? It might have been like Limgrave. It very well might have been just like Limgrave. It's kind of sad to think about in a way. It's true, though. When you look at that map, I mean, all of those flowers, none of them are open. If they all bloom like Millennia's bloom, that could be really fucking bad. That could be really bad news. That alone is a good enough idea for an entire DLC. You imagine DLC where all of the flowers bloom and then the wall around Kaled can no longer contain the scarlet rot and it starts spreading around and you have to like kill avatars of the scarlet rot. That would be really cool. Who knows? I mean, honestly, it's a very fungusy area. I'm wondering if maybe a, a lot of this, like, I, I wonder. Okay, so fungus. There's a mycelium, which is a big network, which is the actual fungus itself. And then the mushroom is the fruiting body that you see which has the spores that disperse. I'm wondering if these flowers are a part of the fruiting body and when they open, they release spores. I might be totally wrong, but it could be a similar concept. Yeah, well, there are, there are fungus, fungus people in this to a degree, you know, so who knows? Although, admittedly, we do have this shot from this trailer that shows that it still kind of looks a bit like a red hellscape here, with the red sky, and this was technically before the Scarlet Rot took hold. Yeah. Caled did still have some culture to boast of, though. For example, in the very middle of Caled, there is, or was, a Celia? town of sorcery called Celia, and despite Radan's relationship with Caria and Raya Lucaria as well, presumably. It was here in Celia that he studied, learning gravitational magics that likely could not be taught anywhere else. He did this, as the story goes, all so he would never have to abandon his beloved but scrawny steed, for gravitational magics could relieve the weight of Radan and allow his scrawny horse to carry him evermore. 
Also, in case you don't know, the horse's name is Leonard, according yep. to the data, so that is the name that we're going to use going forward. Yeah. And what's interesting about Leonard is that he's specifically called out as being scrawny, as if that's the reason why he can't carry Radan, who is enormous. Shouldn't Radan's size be the reason why he can't ride his horse? So I think, personally, that Radan actually didn't become as large as he is for a very long time, and I think there's some good evidence to back that up. For one, his throne in Laindel is of regular Normal size, size yeah. two, his portrait is of a simple grown man, and lastly, we see a brief shot of Radan fighting in this image where he barely yeah. even matches Morgoth in size. So, yeah, what happened? personally, I think that Radan probably only grew in size when he acquired a great rune. Oh. Regardless, at this stage anyway, it's clear that Radan initially learned gravitational magic for the sake of his horse. But that gravitational skill set would certainly come in handy as the years went on. For one, these gravitational magics were passed on to some of his elite soldiers, like Ogre, who was the longest serving member of the Red Main Knights who studied techniques to manipulate gravity alongside Radan. That's cool. The equipment and the skill sets of the Red Main Knights really were very inspired by Radan. For example, the surcoat of Radan's Red Main Knights depicts a red-maned lion raising a sword in the image of Radan. All of them proved that they were worthy of the Red Main name. That's Even cool. their great shield's design takes that symbolism further, being shaped like a fang, and featuring cool the crest shield. of a red-maned lion. And these knights were strong, like Radan too, with descriptions stating that they were reputed to be masterful warriors, and it was popularly said that the red Mains knew no weakness. But for all of their prowess in battle, a conflict was coming that no military strength could ward away. And I'm not talking about the Scarlet Rot, I'm talking about the stars. But yeah. luckily, for this upcoming conflict, Radan was able to solicit the help of an extremely knowledgeable teacher. Extremely. According to the Gravity Well sorcery, Radan's master was an alabaster lord with skin of stone. And these onyx and alabaster lords were a different race entirely to humans. Yeah, they're And were freaky. said to have risen like to em. life when a meteor struck they're long so ago. They're so cool. And the meteorite sorcery tells us that the reason they were called lords was in reverential fear of their destructive power. And it seems like Radan was soliciting their help because a similarly meteoric destructive power was on its way to Celia. So earlier we established that he explicitly did learn gravitational magic so that he could ride his horse, but the Collapsing Stars sorcery also explicitly says that he learned gravitational techniques so that he could challenge the stars, which I think suggests that there were two distinct periods of learning here for Radan. Learning for the sake of his horse, and then learning for the sake of keeping Celia safe. And there's also quite a bit of evidence that suggests that Radan's actions here were in defense. For example, the sword gravestone in Caled specifically tells us that Radan held Celia secure. The Star Scourge heirloom tells us that Radan confronted the falling stars, as if they were the aggressors. Finally, Maybe. this event was also called the... I mean, to be fair, Estelle is a falling star. Dude stole the sky from an eternal city. Like, I could totally understand. Like, like it, I don't think Radon would want an Estelle on Celia. That's understandable. Are these alabaster lords connected to Estelle somehow? I'm not 100% sure, but it seems like they're somewhat related in a way. Maybe not directly, but indirectly, it seems. <clears throat> Star Scourge conflict, suggesting that there was a clash of some kind here, like a back and forth, if you will. So, Radan seemed to anticipate that this event was coming, but I guess that isn't so strange when you consider that Radan was of Carian lineage. I was literally just gonna say, the, uh, the astrologers, like, scried from the sky, they saw a lot of shit. I wouldn't doubt it if they could 
like foresee certain events that were going to happen, like prophecies, you know? I mean, he, he did stop the stars. He certainly did until we came along and fucked it all up. He mucked it all up. Who were renowned for reading fate in yeah, the stars. There we go. So I would think that anticipating a starfall would be pretty straightforward for them. And I think it would make sense that Radan would want to intervene if it was headed for Celia, which is where he learned his magic from in the first place. So Radan took defensive measures. And I guess you might argue that he even went a bit overboard, for he didn't just defend Celia from the falling stars, he actually sealed the stars' movements completely. So after Radan challenged the stars, the fate in the night sky was said to be no more. And this manifests quite literally in Rani's questline, for example, where Radan has to be killed so that the stars can be unfrozen, so, so that cool. one of them can literally smash into Limgrave and open a path to Nokron. Yeah. If not for Radan, I feel like a star would have smashed through Celia instead and opened a path to Nokron that way all those years ago. The eternal city of Nokron is said, after all, to sleep below Celia, so Radan really might have intervened here at the very last moment. Since a star is released and hits Limgrave as soon as you kill Radan, though I'll admit that it is a bit strange that that star hits Limgrave and not Celia, which he was said to defend. I wonder why. Anyway, there's one more thing Maybe I he was talk wrong. about here, and it's that you could also make the argument that Radan might have intervened at Celia and frozen the stars on behalf of the Golden Order. After all, the telescope item description literally says that the fate once writ in the night skies was fettered by the Golden Order. And Radan was a fanboy of Radigan and Godfrey who were two proponents yeah. of the Golden Order, so it's definitely possible that he did this on the Golden Order's behalf Personally, though, I think that both things can be true. I think that Radan was clearly motivated to defend Celia from Starfall, and I think that the Golden Order did stand to benefit from one of its vassals achieving such a feat. Oh, Radan no, Leonard! and most of the demigods at that stage, for that matter, were technically on the side of Marika's Golden Order. So I guess technically Radan was aligned with the Golden Order and could have fettered the stars on their behalf. Technically. But the impression that I get from Radan is that he has no real loyalty to anyone other than himself Makes and sense. his men. This is my speculation, but I think this because he's not really hated by anyone in the current age or anyone in game. Even his brother Rikard has his picture up on the wall, and Rikard famously hated anything to do with the Golden Order. True that. So while I think Radan served the intent of the Golden Order, I don't think he was beholden to it, especially not in the later years when the Elden Ring was shattered. Because remember this cutscene with Morgoth? Willful traitors all. Morgoth labels all of the demigods as traitors That's to the Golden true. Order, including Radan, who we do see in a clash with Morgoth, suggesting that he yeah. might have- Morgoth was a hater though, too. He he had his own shit going on being an omen. Uh, well, this isn't Dark Souls, but Dark Souls does have an actual story. It's just told very differently. This is Elden Ring, which is a Souls game, but it's not a, it's not a Dark Souls game. It's made by the same company. ...have abandoned his loyalty to order and marched on Landell after the shattering. For Radan, like no, his it's demigod kin, had claimed a great rune. And it's easy to assume that a warmonger like him would have had great ambitions for power, and might have even aspired to become Elden Lord. And it's around this time, when the demigods were clashing, <clears throat> that Melania enters the picture once more. Because Melania, Blade of Mikola, was marching towards Caled, past Godric in Limgrave, and towards Radan. Hell yeah. Ugh. This poor girl. Honestly, Godric's nothing more than a jumped up country bumpkin. <laughs> Lord? Oh, don't make me laugh. First, he hid himself amongst the women folk to flee the capital, then hid from Radan in that castle. What a pussy. Then he insulted Melania, 
lost to her in battle, <laughs> only to lick her boots rather than die like a man. Yeah, that's so <laughs> Has funny. Has she no shame? The big girl's blouse. I love this guy. <laughs> I love this, this guy so much. This dialogue from Kenneth Height is a great piece of lore as it tells us about this crucial late part of the Shattering War. Yeah, I remember the first time I went through uh, there and when I was speaking with this guy, I had absolutely no fucking clue who he was talking about because I didn't know any of the characters in it. You know, I went into the game completely blind. Not a single clue about who was what, who did what, where was what. I knew nothing. And so hearing him just talk absolute shit about this guy who I thought was like, oh, he's this big, powerful guy. And then I start learning more about the lore and I'm like, damn. Dude was just spitting facts at us, huh? Shit. Yeah, the... the when we play through again, it's it's gonna hit... I, and at this point, I'm not sure if I want to do a new game plus or if I want to just do a completely new story. I just... I, I, I'll have to think about that. But first, I do need to complete the one that I was working on. Oh yeah. All right, and the next video that we're gonna watch uh, teaches us more about like the grafting and whatnot. So we'll probably learn a little bit more about Godric as well. At this point, Godric had just failed to usurp Laindale capital <laughs> and had fled with his tail between his legs to Stormvale. Here, he hid in fear of Radan, who was a close neighbor in Caled. Yep. And it makes sense that he'd fear Radan, who was considered by many to be the strongest of the demigods. But while he was hiding here, a different army approached. From the north, not the south, as Godric must have feared, Melania and her clean rot knights were passing Stormvale on their southwards march from the Halig tree to Caled. And this event, this passing, is marked at the Leonia Highway Sword Gravestones, which state nothing will hinder the wings of the Blade of Mikola and the Clean Rot Knights. Yep. These gravestones tend to mark points of battle, and Kenneth does state that Godric insulted Melania and lost to her in battle, so I assume this is where that happened. As Probably. to the nature of the insult, well, we have cut dialogue from Godric to help us out yeah, here. Yeah, seller. There is only one tree, and only its branches, that bathe in true rays of gold. Not the fool omen king, nor, nor the rank malformed twins. <laughs> so Godric considered Mikola and Melania rank and malformed. So I assume... Excuse me? Omen king, nor, nor the rank malformed twins. So Godric considered Mikola and Melania rank. Those are some pretty tough words coming from a guy where if he didn't graft on a bunch of other people's body parts, he would get killed by the wind blowing him over. Those are some pretty, those are some pretty sharp little knives he's spitting. Uh, yeah, uh, just because your lineage is golden doesn't mean... That you're all that. When you got fucking slapped by Millennia, who probably didn't even need to fucking break a sweat to give him a good old-fashioned spanking. And malformed. So I assume the insult was along those lines. Oh, which yeah. was not That's smart rich. on Godric's part. Millennia must have messed him up, but tellingly, <laughs> she did not kill him. And that's a curious detail it because wasn't worth it. this was the Shattering War. We're supposed to believe that all of the demigods were fighting for power, but wasn't if Melania was seeking power here and looking for others' great runes to acquire in order to restore the Elden Ring and live up to Mikola or her own Empyrean promise, then you'd think that she would have killed Godric, that she wouldn't have shown him mercy. But instead, she lets him live. So, to me, that suggests that Melania might not have been on this southward march to take power. Because if she didn't claim Godric's great rune, then she probably wasn't here for Radan's either. So, why then? Why did Melania come full force towards Radan on this southward march? I feel like there are three options. 
4 if you count the theory that Melania might have chased down Radan in order to get control of the Elden Ring, but as I've just explained, I feel like that's unlikely. Option 2, although it's still unlikely in my opinion, is that Melania might have sought out Radan simply for the sake of fighting him. He was, after all, widely considered the mightiest of the demigods, as was Melania in many cases, yeah. so it's not ridiculous to think that both of them might have fought simply for the sake of pitting their strength. Yeah, there can only be one. Against one another, but that's a pretty unsatisfactory answer, in my opinion. Option three, I feel, could be because Melania was looking for her brother. At this point, Mikula could have That's already true. been stolen away by Moog, That's true. so perhaps she was simply looking for him. She yeah. pretty intentionally makes a beeline towards the south and towards Kaled, and Moog's palace is right essentially underneath Celia. And yeah, because they can sense each other, right? So if she senses that Mikula is in that direction, she might like think like, oh, like, if it's not like a, a direct like GPS needle, you know, she's like, where the fuck is Mikula? I sense him near here. Turns out he was just, he's just downstairs. And underneath the area where Radan and Melania fought. So I guess it's possible that Melania had some intel leading her here mm -hmm. in a search for Mikola. But again, this is only speculation. But my favorite theory oh, is the fourth one, which is that Melania and by extension, Mikola may have wanted Radan dead for the same reason that Rani eventually does, so that the stars yeah. could resume their movement, That's true. bringing certain fates back. How easily would... Um... Okay, so I know there's multiple ways to get down there, but I don't know the exact way to get to Moog's... Uh, like, what is, it? is it called Mogwin's Palace? But when the star does come down, smashes a hole down in Necron. I'm wondering if there's like anything else that Radon was doing to hold back her from getting down there. Because I know you can take the lifts down to like the Shifra River and whatnot. And you can see Mogwin Palace down there, right? I remember looking at it and being like, oh, I bet you can go there. Like, that looks like where a boss should be. And everybody's just like, yeah. Yeah, you can get there somehow. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I just gotta... I just gotta, just gotta figure it out. I'll, I'll find out. I'll find out. I will. Sorry, Bing. Sorry, Bing. Back into play. And you might be asking, but why would Mikola want the stars to resume their movement? Well... Perhaps Mikola's own fate was locked in stasis. True. We do find a demigod's amber starlight shard in Mikola's hideaway, after all, and I feel like it should be concerning that well, his fate might have there. fallen like this. But the best answer, I think, is that Mikola wanted the stars back in motion so that the moon could properly eclipse the sun. This True. was a ritual. To revive uh, Godwin. Yo, that is so true. Man. All the lore videos coming together to this very moment. That Mikola seemed to believe would revive Godwin the Golden, his brother. And we talk about this a lot more in this video. <clears throat> yeah. And I can definitely see how the stars being in stasis would prevent the moon from eclipsing yeah, the sun. That makes sense. So I really like this answer. Some good but DLC. I'd love to hear uh, your theories. There. Surely there is more than just these four options. But in the end, there's only really one answer that I'm confident in, and it's that we can't confidently say for sure why Melania fought Radan. Not yet, anyway. But whatever the reason, it must have been a good one, because it was during this battle that Melania sacrificed everything. Yeah. There is something I must return to Melania. The will that was once her own. The dignity. The sense of self. That allowed her to resist the call of the Scarlet Rot. The pride she abandoned. To meet Radan's measure. 
In Elden Ring's story trailers, we see this legendary fight play out. Cleanrot knights finally arrive with Melania, facing off against the Redmain knights, and manage to plunge a ton of spears into Radan during their clash. You can actually see these spears still sticking out of his back to this day. Then, Melania and Radan appear to be the only two left standing. Melania sacrifices her prosthetic arm to get close to Radan, grabbing her blade and plunging it into both of them, giving us a close-up view of the two characters. Here, Radan looks monstrous, which I theorize could again be because he's tainted with the madness of a great rune, though that is just speculation. And we can also see Melania's lips moving here, muttering some final words, or perhaps the incantation for the Scarlet Aeonia, which envelops herself and Radan, putting an end to their fight. In this video's first chapter, we talked extensively about Melania's battle against the Scarlet Rot within her, but in this moment, she seems to lose that fight, maybe intentionally, and she allows the Scarlet Rot to take hold. Millicent, who is a great parallel to Melania, says that this is when she sacrificed her dignity, her sense of self, her will, and her pride. Melania did all of this just so that she could meet Radan's measure. Thus did the Scarlet Rot explode outwards, infecting Radan and the very land itself as their battle came to a horrific standstill. In the end, neither party was in a state to continue fighting, so technically Melania didn't lose, so she was technically still undefeated. Few survived the Battle of Aeonia, but one who did was the clean rot knight Finlay, oh. who, in an unimaginable act of heroism, carried the slumbering form of Melania all the way back to the Halic Tree. Oh. They managed this alone, fending off all Those manner guys of were foes fucked. along the way. So but annoying. Back at the center of Kaled, Melania's scarlet bloom remained. A nearby phantom's dialogue reads, Sublime, I tell you. The very first flower of Aeonia bloomed on this very spot. Melania, may you blossom into a goddess. In the present day, Caleb features at its center a giant tree that spirals in a similar manner to Melania's first scarlet bloom. Yeah. So it probably is the same scarlet bloom. As the phantom says, this was the very first flower of Aeonia and the beginning of the Scarlet Swamp in this land. And at the very center of that is another curious thing. There's a boss called Commander O'Neill, oh, who okay. carries the Commander's standard, which reads, even after his lord was fled, Commander O'Neill continued to brandish this flag in the devastation of the rot-eaten field of battle. The sole veteran who remembers this battle with pride. And it's hard for me to say exactly whose side O'Neill would have been on. He summons the spirits of exiled soldiers, who themselves have no real affiliation to speak of. Hmm. Though, I will say that you can summon one of Millicent's sisters to help you in the fight against O'Neill, which might suggest that he's opposed to the idea of Rot, and that he might have fought for Radan. Although, I feel like you could go both ways on this, because the commander's standard says that his lord was fled, and both Melania and Radan fled this battle. Anyway, yeah. when you defeat O'Neill by luring him into the guises of Scarlet Rot because it's funny, he doesn't just drop the commander's standard, he also drops an heirloom of the Battle of Aeonia, a broken needle of unalloyed gold oh. that was once buried within Melania's own flesh, oh. repelling her Scarlet Rot until it snapped. A really interesting question here, considering the needle is broken, is whether Melania snapped the needle intentionally when she plunged her blade into oh. herself and Rodan. Perhaps she knew that it would cause the rot within her to flare up worse. That brings up a whole other point. True. Maybe she did. Maybe she stabbed him to hold on to him and then stabbed herself in the place where the needle was to unleash the rot because she didn't want to lose. Oh shit. Yeah. We're learning. 
than ever if the needle was broken and allow her to defeat Radan. Millicent does explain that the explosion of rot in her is worse after she takes out the needle. Almost yeah. as if it's been building up inside them all this time. I paused to even tell you, but I took out the needle myself. The scarlet rot writhes now, worse than ever. So it's pretty clear that this is where the final moments of the battle took place. And we oh, even okay. find clean rot knights able to rise outside when you're near, even now. But then we don't find Radan anywhere near here. Instead, no, that's we true. find him closer to his former home at right. Redmain Castle. So that's a in a nearby catacomb, the spirits of the war dead actually continue to clash, refusing to surrender, even in death. And outside, Radan is exactly the same way. And while witless, he's still alive even managing to keep the stars in stasis, even now, Crazy. for he's still in possession of his great rune, which itself started to burn to resist the encroachment of the Scarlet Rot. His feet have rotten off, the spears of clean rot knights remain in his flesh, but he fights on, simply using those spears in his back as arrows to fight off anyone who threatens That's him. That's badass. Refusing to give up and die in anything but an honorable death. Yeah, apparently. Dude was fucking determined. Are you one for festivals? Or yeah. flowers? To the south, a grand festival to make the stars turn. This all to makes so much east, more sense. The heart and butt of a flower to be. But dare you enter into the heart of the scarlet rot. As the rot takes hold, Caled becomes... Alright, we need some more background information on these fucking enemies. Because they're... they're kind of all over. I, yeah, I know. He basically has to ride around on Leonard. A lot of him is rotted out. Dude was infected with the Scarlet Rot. It's the it's the it's the, the gravity magic, making it so Leonard can carry him. Have you seen Leonard jump? Have you seen him freaking drum drump? Have you seen him jump? He can jump like a fucking legend, though. I, you know, a lot of horses, they've got a lifespan of what, like 30 years or so? Roughly 30 years? Leonard's, you know, he's looking pretty good for being a few thousand years old. At this, actually, you know what? At this point, is Leonard even still alive? I'm not, like, I'm not kidding. How old is Leonard? What magic did he put on Leonard to make him live so fucking long? Because it's been thousands of years. Yeah, I gotta say, he's just cursed. It sucks. A fresh hell, and the land itself becomes a threat. Even the dragons in this place were forced to flee, and they would oh, that's make true. a new yeah, nest nothing can die. on a plateau Not properly. that would be dubbed Dragon Barrow, and no one since then has dared to enter it. That said, a few dragons did not make it away unscathed. The dragon Exekis succumbed to the Scarlet Rot, though he did not forget his hatred, and sadly, Grail, the mother of all yeah. dragons, who dwarfs them all as well, can be found on Death's Door surrounded by her children and completely blighted by the Scarlet Rot. Kind of sad. Thanks for the 50k runes, though. Yeah. And in really. the end, it was Melania's Scarlet Rot, not really Melania herself that would eventually drive Radan's red main knights to defeat. According to their armor, when they were driven to defeat by Melania's Scarlet Rot, the red main knights burned off the crest on the left breast of their armor to indicate their resolve, stating, Alas, dear home, I shan't see you again, for our duty is to remain here, a bulwark against the blight. The knights using fire to burn away their own crest in this way is such a great symbol, for fire was their one and only weapon for fighting back against the rot, 
And interestingly, yeah. according to the Armourer's Cookbook, a lot of these tools and techniques to do with fire were passed down by an armourer who served the great General Radan, as his books contain knowledge of dealing with rot, the application of fire in particular. And so this flame of the Red Mains clearly became a large part of their identity henceforth. Corpses of rabid wildlife were piled high and burned, long smouldering walls of flame were built in order to prevent the rot from spreading to neighbouring lands. These same walls border their own castles, they burnt down churches, and yeah. they even managed to commandeer some flame chariots to help in their fight. They utilised torches, fire pots, arrows, everything. And fittingly, Knight Jeren's beloved sword, a flambeurge, became the symbol of the castle itself, thanks to the flame-like undulation that cool. gives this sword its difficult to pronounce name. And Jaren himself remained at Redmain Castle to regularly host a celebration of war, yeah. calling champions from far and wide to deliver death. A death for his friend, who is now festering with rot and crippled by madness, who now only wishes for an honourable way out. Meanwhile, amidst Melania's Aeonian butterflies, pale pests emerge from Probably. the swamp of Aeonia. And though they appear to be Probably mere bridges. bugs, they're not. These creatures are intelligent, with a quote-unquote keen intellect that allows them to craft uncanny weaponry from That's sharpened cool. shell. That they can really encant cool. spells as well, and they can even tame wild beasts. That said, they are ultimately creatures of worship, and Gowrie actually calls them witless, which admittedly does contrast with them being described as intelligent in this item description. Regardless, the pests are also called the abandoned children of the goddess and servants of the goddess of rot who have been forsaken. And it's not hard to see why. Uh, not only was Melania carried far away at the very moment of her bloom when these pests allegedly emerged, but she resents and resists the scarlet rot inside her unless she's pushed to the absolute brink. So, of course, these pests are abandoned in that yeah. sense as well. And who wouldn't hate them, honestly? Is there anything more annoying than this bloody attack? Yeah, it's so fucking annoying. The pests persist. True. They even have a quotable line of dialogue in the Kindred of Rot's Exaltation Talisman, which reads, Rot for the Scarlet Goddess. O Scarlet Blossoms flourish in distant lands and return to us the unwanted children. That's some xenomorph shit right there. That's sick. I love that. Rot for the Scarlet Goddess. O Scarlet Blossoms flourish in distant lands and return to us the unwanted children. Yeah, I mean, I imagine once she has her third bloom, she might have gone back and just been like, ah, fuck it, I am rot. But at that point, she's not really herself anymore. Which brings us to the phrase, Scarlet Blossoms. Yeah. This might not be talking about literal flower buds of the Scarlet Rot. But the third but bloom. But instead, I think it's talking about actual people. I think it's talking about these five sisters. I think Maybe. these are the Scarlet Blossoms. They are Pollyanna, Maureen... Amy, Mary, and Millicent. So, all of these individuals, they they are Millennia's daughters? Like, actual daughters. I can fix her, yeah. The girl, Millicent, she is a bird. Green and undeveloped, waiting to flower into magnificence. What a wondrous day that will be. In truth, before her, I'd never seen a bud of such superior quality. She might very well outshine her sisters. So it seems like these pests, including Gary, perhaps, have a keen interest in cultivating these scarlet blossoms. I'd prefer to talk about Millicent's questline in a future Prepare to Cry episode, so oh, subscribe yeah. and turn on notifications, but I will hold off for now. But essentially, Gowrie does all of this in anticipation of these daughters becoming Scarlet Valkyries, who he oh. believes might one day serve Melania when she ascends as the Goddess of Rot. That would be so cool. That would be so, so, so cool. But unfortunately, it doesn't happen, because I happen. At this point, 
Melania hadn't been seen for a long while, not since she was carried off to the Halig Tree, and the Halig Tree's location itself was a mystery to many, but there were still those who venerated and worshipped her, and they weren't all pests. Some of them were human, like Malie Marai, the Castellan of the Shaded Castle. Malie wears the Marai mask, which is something only worn by the head of House Marai. It bears the likeness of the first of their line, and it describes this long, dual history of the Marai family, who served as both executioners and castellans of the Shaded Castle. So fittingly, their storied sword is the Marai Executioner's Sword, a broad-bladed weapon that would eventually be used against them. For Sorry. one day, they made the mistake of capturing a bell-bearing hunter named Elima, but Elima who knew battle skills that allowed him to move objects with his very own will, snatched the sword from the sight of his looming execution and overthrew his captors. Ow. But it doesn't seem like he wanted to rule over the castle in their stead. Instead, the castle falls into ruin, and when we find him, Elima is just standing and staring at an enormous portrait, which is a picture of Melania, Melania yeah. who some believe is to blame for the fate of the castle. Ooh, maybe. A nearby phantom laments the state of things and states, House Mirai is ruined, just deserts for falling for that severed harpy. No surprise that guilty cretin took the castle and our storied sword. In the outskirts of the castle, you can actually find and fight Malie Mirai, the former castellan of the castle huh. who has now been ousted. He wields the ant spur rapier which is a weapon that evokes the scorpion dagger that we mentioned at the start of the yeah. video, as it's also a blade fashioned from a chitinous creature. In this case, it's the spur of a giant ant. Okay. Fittingly then, its description reminds us that Scarlet Rot is an old legend, and goes on to state that Malie Marai of the Shaded Castle was a private believer in the Scarlet Rot. And indeed, he eventually found his own personal goddess. Oh yeah. The Marai robe explains why he was so enamored with her, stating that the sons of House Marai are all sickly born, and so Malie Marai was beguiled by the beautiful and fierce goddess who was born into rot. Melania was, after all, a powerful and fierce figure in spite of her affliction, so it's easy to see why Malie Marai looked up to her. Though I guess it's possible that he took this veneration too far, as the castle is found sinking into a poison swamp, yep. and the it's throne room is filled with prosthetics which mirror Melania's own. Yeah, Indeed, you know, when I first went through this place, I, I mean, I obviously, I, I had no idea where Melania, like, was. I didn't know she was at the Halig Tree, but like, I thought we were going to end up running into Melania here. Like, there were just so many things. And then I kept running around Kaelid, like, ah, oh, is she here? Like, everybody kept talking about, like, oh, you gotta find Millennia, you gotta find Millennia, you gotta find Millennia. And I... I didn't really know the first place to look. Now that I know, like, their history and everything, I'll have at least a few more clues. And when I listen to NPCs speak, I can hear what they say and actually understand what the fuck they're saying. I don't think Millicent and her sisters are actual children of Millennia. Millicent says Millennia lost a part of herself. Um, the pride to reach for John's measure. So I think when Millennia bloomed and lost part of herself, that part of her made Millennia split into the sisters and Millicent. Is, who knows? It could. I, you could be totally right, Seller. You could be totally right. I, I would have to learn more about it. Although he's going to do a prepare to cry on Millicent, it seems. So that... We'll probably learn an awful lot more about her there. We'll see. Possible that he even found Melania's very own prosthetic, as you can loot the Valkyrie's prosthesis here, yeah, I have which that. reads, Golden prosthesis once used by the one-armed Valkyrie, yeah. a masterwork of craftsmanship. With practice and skill, it can be used as proficiently as a real arm. Cool. When Malay Mirai, Lord of the Shaded Castle, embraced this prosthesis, he claimed to feel the presence of his personal goddess. Now, I'm not really sure if this is Melania's actual prosthesis or not. I feel like you could make debates for and against that, but regardless, 
It drives home just how much of a fanboy. Yeah, you venerated her a lot. But in the end, the castle is not much more now than just a home for some surviving clean rot knights who would understandably feel at home in such a place. And I guess they have nowhere else to go as Melania slumbers back at the Halig tree, yeah. where she does very little else until you arrive and trigger what I think is her second transformation. Wait, the scarlet bloom flowers once more. You will witness true horror. Now, rot. Now, I got some bad news for you guys in this final chapter. So, you know how difficult Melania was to defeat, right? Well, what if I told you that wasn't her final form? It might not be, for the Scarlet Aeonia description reads, each time the scarlet flower blooms, Melania's rot advances, and with the third bloom, she will become a true goddess. So, it's known that Melania's first bloom was in Caled, yeah. and we know that she blooms in a fight against us, so the debate becomes, is this mid-fight bloom Melania's second bloom, or her third? Some would argue that this is Melania's third bloom, and that she's already become the Goddess of Rot. She does, after all, literally have Goddess of Rot as her title, and there is a bloom right outside her boss room which could have been the site of her second. Yeah, that's the bloom I know nothing about. Right there. That's what I want to learn about. Bloom. So how do you argue against that? Well, for starters, the bloom outside might not be hers. For one, it'd be kind of weird if she had a second bloom that is never described yeah. right here when she's slumbering in just the neighboring room. But not only that, in front of this bloom, you actually loot the Traveler's set, which is the same set worn by Millicent yeah. and her sisters. Also worn by Melina. Just thought I would point that out and Melina as well. Ah, there we go. Considering <laughs> Millicent and her sisters are buds of Melania, and considering Millicent also leaves behind okay. one of these blooms when she dies, oh, it's not ridiculous okay. to think that one of these sisters might have flowered here already. Mm. And I don't think that Melania having Goddess of Rot in her boss title means that much. Many, like Gowry and the Pests, already believe that Melania is the Goddess of Rot. Okay. The Scarlet Aeonia description instead specifies that the third bloom will make her a true goddess, and I think anything before that is just a brief flash of the Rot God shining through. But the biggest piece of evidence that Melania hasn't yet reached her third bloom yet, in my opinion, comes from Gowry, who goes to extraordinary lengths to nurture Millicent, encouraging us to kill her even, just so this betrayal can turn her into a scarlet Valkyrie that will serve Melania. It must be done by your hand, no other. Millicent trusts you, rather deeply in fact. Sever that trust. Nurtured by betrayal, her bud will flower most vividly. When Melania ascends to godhood, Millicent too shall be reborn as a scarlet Valkyrie. If Millicent dies, she flowers, with Gowry's expectation being that she will be revived after this. So considering that there's a bloom in Melania's boss room as well that appears after you defeat her, I feel like it's possible that Melania could have another revivification after this as well. And one final piece of evidence was actually pointed out by you guys in the comments of my recent Oracle short. In that video, I argued that the Oracles might be there to herald the return of Mikla as a god, as their spirit ashes state that it is said that when Oracle envoys appear playing their pipes, they do so to herald the arrival of a new god or age. But I completely neglected to mention that they might be here to herald Melania's ascension as a god instead. So thank you guys for pointing that out. Uh, if you haven't already, I'd appreciate if you tried out some of my shorts content. It's extremely difficult to fit everything within 60 seconds, but it's a fun challenge and I'm pretty happy yeah. with some of the short stories that I've been able to tell in okay. those shorts. Anyway, 
personally, I wouldn't be surprised if we fight some incarnation of Melania again in the DLC. Yeah, and same. I'd be down for Yo, that fight, provided she That would be really cool. We've talked about this before, right? You've brought it up before, Bridges. Uh, a duo fight with Melania and Mikola? Oh. Uh, Millicent says that she needs to return something to her money yeah, that will allow her to be resistant. Yeah. The blind sword. I, I think that the blind swordsman would be really awesome to explore further. I'd really like that. She rises again with her lower half as a scorpion or something. But what I find to be the most disturbing thought about Melania's potential third bloom is that Gowrie believes a scarlet bloom will be more vivid if it's nurtured by betrayal. That's Oof. what we see in Millicent's questline. So what if Melania's third bloom could be more vivid if she's betrayed by her brother, Mikola? But it's like- Oh! Now. And I'm really getting into some deranged speculation territory, aren't I? So that's probably my cue to end the video. A special thanks to Mispat for the footage and editing help, as always. And special thanks to Quelag as well for looking over this script. And thank you, as always, for watching. Oh, man. Another fantastic video, Vati. Another fantastic video. I mean, I'll always watch stuff about, uh, about Melania. Damn, though, dudes. That's wild. That's a long video. <laughs> I mean, that took us a while. That's fine, though. Damn. Oh, so we know we're getting another prepare to cry. And it's going to be on Millicent, which to be honest is probably the, like one of the ones I, I most wanted to see a prepare to cry about after watching a bunch of Melania stuff and learning about the, uh, the buds. I don't know a dang thing about the other four buds. I know a little about Millicent because I remember running into her and getting the needle for her and everything. And then there was supposed to be some other stuff that I think I was supposed to do. And then I just ran off and be, <laughs> excuse me. And because in Elden Ring, there's no like quest page where you can keep track of your quests and like go back and be like, oh, so what am I supposed to do again? You just kind of have to remember like a normal real person. You, know, you hear someone say something and you're like, oh yeah, okay. And then you wander off somewhere and then you're like, oh, what was I supposed to do again? That is how I played Elden Ring. I just stumbled into everything, not knowing anything. And at this point, I don't know if I want to do a new game plus. I think I'm going to beat it and then I'm going to play again as a warrior completely from the beginning again. I feel like that would be interesting. Yeah, an IRL physical notebook, which I did not have. Uh, but no, I... Uh, oh, man. It's gonna be interesting fighting Millennia. I'm probably gonna have to spend the like half of the time fighting her, just learning how to dodge her attacks so she doesn't heal up so much. Oh my god, this is gonna be Doom DLC boss part two all over again. We'll see how it goes. I am pretty over leveled. And I am a gravity mage, so we'll see. If I can hit her with enough spells I might I might be able to do this we'll see I just have to have the right physics if I was aggressive enough sooner or later I out damaged or heal it. yeah see that's that's the thing I'm probably it's gonna be like a lot of other bosses I'm gonna probably use rock sling a bunch and it's gonna be like I use one rock sling and then I have to dodge a few attacks and then I use another rock sling Although I'm, especially when I'm fighting melee, I'm very good at just getting in there and just going like, I remember when I uh, was playing Dark Souls 3, um, when I was doing melee, a lot of the time I really would just run in there and just 
I'd get greedy. And oftentimes it got me killed, but more, more often than not, it got me killed. But, but I would do an awful lot of damage and I would get shit done quick if I did it right. You know what I mean? I beat I beat some bosses um pretty darn quick just by getting in and smacking them as much as possible. Like the 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 curse rotted great wood, I believe it was called. I beat it on the third time. I th I I that's probably not exactly what it was called. Might be right, might be wrong. Sounds like you're gonna first time her with that attitude. Yeah, fucking right. We'll see, bud. Honestly, though, a lot of the time I'll fight a boss and I'll like get to the second stage first time and I'll get through a bunch of it and then I will lose and then it'll take me like five or six more tries to get to the second stage and then I like I always I almost always do my second best on the first try and then I do my best on the last obviously but that's how it goes with me i do really well the first try and then i die um and then i do terribly for a while and then i finally beat them out of out of the blue oh my god i would lose my shit i would absolutely lose my shit if i beat her on the first try but i just i'm not gonna it's just how i ugh, i'm not expecting to but like I, I beat a lot of Dark Souls 3 bosses on the first try. And I don't think it was necessarily because I grinded a lot and had like a lot of health or whatever, because a lot of bosses could still take you out in a couple hits if they hit you uh enough times. I just got into the groove. Like I beat the dancer of the Boreal Valley pretty gosh darn quick I didn't let her use her crazy attack that was the thing I just went very aggressively against her and just slaughtered her if you don't think about it like at all and just go in aggressive it's possible yeah well I don't know I mean I'm 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 a gravity mage so it's a little harder um next playthrough though for sure I'm I'm gonna go melee build I'm gonna be a warrior and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to melee the game I think the main reason why I was intimidated by doing melee uh, was probably because of that uh, that knight in the beginning, that golden knight. Fuck that guy. But I am going to properly play it. Yes. Anyways, I think that's enough for this one. <laughs> I need to pee, man. Only a true warrior can be Millennia Gravity Mage. Be damned. Hey, to be fair, she never beat Radon, though, and he was a gravity mage. Think of that. Think of that, Bridges. Shove that in your ear and think about it. <laughs>